Um, this feels like the perfect moment to be talking about what happened with the class of 2023 and how we look forward, because tomorrow is in fact May 1st, which is the universal reply date, um, at which point all seniors should have made a commitment to the college that they hope to enroll in in the fall. Um, for juniors out there, um, what I will let you know is that that means that a year from tomorrow, you will also know where you're gonna be going to school. And that's an exciting thing um, to know that the process is underway um, and that also that you know when the end is coming. Um, um, sorry. Um, so just a couple of things that we're gonna uh, give you as an overview that are here on the slide that we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth. Um, you see the, the Forbes headline right there, college applications up dramatically. Um, and that has been a trend. There has been an increase in application numbers. Um, the demographics are changing, who's applying and how they're applying, not just where they're applying. Um, the continued um, the continued process of optional standardized testing. Colleges that are announcing that they're going to maintain their test optional status. Um, those that have a few that have said they're going back to requiring testing. And some like the UC systems that have said that they are not going to consider testing at all. And that is a permanent on a permanent basis. Um, also, the idea of more alternative first year programs, optional kinds of things for freshmen, um, and different ways that students are being admitted. So we'll talk about all of those in a little bit more depth. So you can see here that between the 2019-2020 application cycle, otherwise known as pre-COVID, to the 2022-23 cycle, the first one that was really in a post-COVID, the total number of applications submitted on the Common App went up by like a quarter of a million apps, okay? Um, I'm sorry, the total quarter of a million applicants. Um, and the number of applications um, went up by a million. Um, Student, more students are applying, more students are using the Common App, and each applica applicant is submitting more applications. Um, and that's something that we've been seeing. It happened just from when we started the pandemic upwards, and that has a tie-in with test optional, to be sure, um, and with additional institutions every year joining the Common App driving those applications to that particular platform. Um, we saw something very similar at the UC system, one of the largest you know, university systems in the country, um, a highly competitive um, group of schools and their applications between that pre-COVID, post-COVID year um, went up again by 50,000. Um, and, and a large growth in first year applicants as well. Um, I think that one of the things that I would point out about the UC applications, and I think that their growth is particularly tied to um, their being test free, because suddenly your test scores are not getting in your way of being able to be a viable candidate for a Berkeley or a Santa Barbara or a San Diego, for example. Sorry, I didn't mean to backtrack on those slides. Okay, so these are in, ter in terms of these trends. We have discovered that, you know, in the course of the time between 2019, 2020, and today, we are seeing a tremendous growth in previously underrepresented groups, mar you know, marginalized groups of students, um, that, that trend shows them increasing by 31%, um, which is a very large number. Um, first generation to college applicants increased by even more. 
Okay, and again, this is something that we are seeing um, as a result of standardized testing and also the encouragement of colleges who are looking for these students. Um, international applicants has also increased. Um, in fact, more than triple the rate of domestic applicants. Okay, um, and this is you know, a couple of things happened. It's a little easier now post pandemic to be able to get a visa to come to this country because during the pandemic, so many students were, were not able to even consider coming here. Um, so now that those restrictions have lifted, I think we are seeing a great interest in study in the United States, but I also think that we may be dealing with a little bit of a backlog of students who couldn't apply for a while and now they're able to. So that particular number I think may taper off at a slightly quicker pace than with do the domestic growth in applications. Um, the, the bounty, right, the, the, the extra applications are being spread all across the spectrum in terms of colleges in terms of their selectivity. Um, we are seeing big bumps in application rates at colleges, certainly the most selective. Um, last week, Harvard, Yale, Brown, in, you know, announced that they had their highest number of applications and their lowest acceptance rates. But it's not just the Ivy League. It's certainly um, we're we're seeing that application growth all over. Um, the next point is absolutely true. The public institutions application rates increased by thirty nine percent, which is partly a recognition of the wonderful work that's being done at those institutions, particularly in the research divisions, um, and also the great value. Um, that families can find at a public institution. That said, there's 24% increase in private application in private institutions. So they are certainly having their share of the new applications as well. Um, <clears throat> in terms of being test optional, with so many schools test optional, people wonder, well, you know, is anybody submitting their applications? And how much, I mean, submitting testing with their applications, how much has it decreased? And this is a fairly easy answer. 74% pre pandemic applicants submitted their test scores. 43% did it last year. Okay. And colleges are very eager to publish and will show you on their websites what percentage of the entering class submitted their applicants, submitted their scores, and you will see that many, many students were admitted to all of these schools without their scores. Um, it's important to remember, I think, I think some people, particularly when they're new to this process, feel like test optional just happened at the pandemic. Um, and that's not true. I mean, certainly the pandemic sped things up, but there were many colleges that were test optional for decades. Um, leading up to the pandemic. And they were the ones who told everybody else that it's possible to evaluate students and admit a great class without considering standardized testing. The one point that's not on this slide that I do want to talk about um, that was on the first slide is the idea of additional and new alternate first year programs and admission plans. You know, one of the things that's happening with colleges as they are getting this increase of qualified candidates, right? More students that they would like to take than they have room for. Um, many of them are creating different ways to do that, okay? So um, first year abroad programs used to be at a handful of colleges. And now we find that many colleges offer students the chance to spend their freshman year abroad, and then rather than doing a junior year abroad, or sometimes in addition to. Um, and there's a couple of things to need, you need to know about that. The first is 
that those are particularly great programs for students in engineering and business tracks where it's sometimes harder to go abroad once you've begun your sequence. Um, and also a freshman year abroad is structured differently than a junior year abroad. By junior year, students have a lot of freedom when they're in another country and they're living on their own and all of those sorts of things. The first year abroad programs are not like that. They're highly structured. Um, so families can feel comfortable sending a freshman year student off on a first year abroad. Um, and the other thing is admission plans. Um, many colleges are offering something that they now refer to as either a spring scholar program or a sophomore scholar program. And those are opportunities for students to spend their first semester doing something else and then enroll as a in the second semester of the freshman year. Um, it lets things shake out a little bit at the college. Some students will leave and go abroad the second semester. And so it makes room for the incoming freshmen. Um, and this is an opportunity for colleges, as I said, to admit more students that they want um, by staggering when they arrive on campus. <clears throat> So, teens after COVID. You know, COVID was, you know, I, I, I sit here and I think about the fact that COVID was really hard on me and it was really hard on my friends, right? But we're adults, right? And then you look at kids and teenagers and how hard COVID was on them. Okay, so. 11th graders are already in the process, so good for all of you. Um, you will be the first to use the new FAFSA. Um, I believe that when we see the Supreme Court decisions, which mm. are, which everyone anticipates will pull race, will pull consideration of race back out of the process, I think we will also see less focus on legacy in admissions. I think that there's going to be a balance that comes in that says, if we don't do this, we won't do that. Um, and there may be a conversation about AI um, <clears throat> as part of this admission cycle. Colleges have not yet really started expressing what they're thinking about uh, AI chat GPT. And so we have to just keep an eye on what they tell us. For students in the 11th grade, because you are getting ready to fill out applications and write essays, you have to think about the fact that you want to show colleges that you are able to read, write, and think, okay? Colleges are gonna teach you the other things, but they wanna know that you can do this, right? And so you need to think about this and also how you're gonna tell them who you are. What story will your application tell about you? And how will you reinforce it in your essays and supplements, right? Um, they want, at this point, we want students to continue to maximize their academic rigor, okay? Keep working hard, keep trying to learn as much as you can and to try to go deeper into your activities. This is a time to step up to leadership, <coughs> excuse me. Um, to think about being captain or co-captain or an editor or a treasurer or any of those things. Um, and if you are finding that you need something beyond your school or beyond what you're finding, um, I encourage students now to create their own projects, okay? If you're interested in film, see what you can do in filmmaking. Research, um, publication, I know there's a program with that, that I'm sure Rebecca will tell you more about later. This idea of sort of creating your own extracurricular activity was born in COVID, right? When students couldn't do the things that they had planned to do, they went out and did other things. Um, and by went out, I don't mean they left their house. I mean, they, they worked on their own 
Um, they contacted, you know, there's a way to contact researchers through the Kairos program. Um, and this became very much accepted by colleges and they really kind of like it. So it shows that entrepreneurial, innovative, self-starter thing that colleges love. Um, and students can really focus on doing something that is exactly what they care about. Um, so it came out of COVID, but I don't think it is going anywhere. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, as you are thinking about where to apply, try to, you know, try to cast a wide net mm -hmm. as you do your research, okay? Research should certainly be broad. So to look at different kinds of colleges, big, small, rural, urban, suburban, um, different parts of the country, close to home, um, and begin the application process early. Now is a good time for juniors to be doing that research so that you can be able to have a college list um, that you're working on um, and so that you can begin working on your, um, your writing this summer. <clears throat> 